Okay, welcome back everyone. I have uh, just started the recording of our next uh, second lecture today. All right, so let's take a few moments for some questions uh, and before we uh, continue further, we have uh, Divya's question. Sp can you explain the riches of inheritance mentioned in Ephesians 1.18, right? So, okay, good question here. So uh, the Bible, especially in the writings of the Apostle Paul, he talks about inheritance that we have obtained. Right. So you find this in verse uh, 18, yeah, the, the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Yeah. Um, but you also find him using this word inheritance um, on other occasions in the same chapter. Right. So if you look at verse 11, Ephesians 1.11, it says, In whom, that is in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance. That means we have already received an inheritance. But then he goes on in verse 14, Ephesians 1 verse 14, he says about the Holy Spirit, he is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So, He's talking about two parts of our inheritance. There is the inheritance that we have obtained, which we already have here and now. And then he says, the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a guarantee. Um, the, the Greek word there is down payment, as a guarantee of the in inheritance talking about something we are going to receive. And what is that? It's the redemption of the purchased possession. So we are purchased possession. We are God's purchased possession. But the fullness of that redemption is going to come in the future. So there is a part of our inheritance we enjoy here and now. And there is also a part of the inheritance we are going to enjoy in the future. Are you with me so far? Yeah. So that's what he's talking about. That means he says, I want you to, I want the eyes of your understanding to be opened. So you will know the written inheritance that God has given to us as his people. Right? Part of that inheritance we have already obtained, meaning it's already ours here and now. Part of this inheritance is going to come in the future. Right? It is something that God has, uh, which will come in the future when, you know, we are, you know, that we have our glorified bodies and, you know, we will reign with him in eternity and so on. So all those things are still yet to come. Okay. Uh, does that answer your question, Divya? Yes, yes, Pastor. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, and I had uh, just one more, uh, not a follow-up, but... Uh, like uh, those who realize this, uh, you know, identity in Christ, what are some uh, markers or um, how do we identify like people who really know this identity? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the best way I could say it is this, that the whole purpose of God bringing us into Christ is so that we can be like Christ. Okay? The whole purpose of God bringing us into Christ is so that we can be like Christ. You know? So, how can we identify, you know, uh, and I, we will talk about this maybe if you have time before we close the class today. How can we identify somebody who has received this revelation? Well, they'll be growing in their likeness, into their likeness of Jesus. They'll be more and more like Jesus because that's the whole purpose 
of God bringing us into Christ so that we can be like Christ, right? And we'll keep on growing into that likeness of Jesus. So you could say like, yeah, that person really knows who they are in Christ because they're growing up into that. Yeah, they're growing up into becoming like Christ in every area yeah, of our lives. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so is it like saying that you will know them, like Jesus, when he says, like you will know them by their fruit? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. You'll know them by the life they live, the ministry they manifest, uh, you know, by, by the way they walk and the way they minister. You know that they are, hey, this person knows the identity in Christ, you know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Pastor. Okay, so we're still now in Ephesians chapter 1, right? Now, everything I'm sharing with you right now is in the PDF so that we have put in the coursework so you can download it and review it. I'm just uh, speaking to you, but everything is in the PDF there. Uh, so some more things that we want to highlight from Ephesians chapter 1 and some things we will look at later. First of all, I want us to understand that this whole thing about being in Christ was something God planned before the foundation of the world. We look at that in verse 4, Ephesians 1 verse 4. It says, He chose us in Him, in Christ. That's what we are studying, in Christ. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. You know, so that means God decided even before he created, before the foundation of the world is just a phrase in the New Testament that says before creation, before God began to create things. Even before he created, God decided that he's going to have a people who will be in Christ, in him. You know? So when, you, when we study the scripture, the New Testament, and look for the phrase, before the foundation of the world, you, will, you and I will find, we will find that in the mind of God, he finished everything before he started. God finished his work before he started the work, right? That's what Hebrews um, chapter three and uh, verse four, and we can just cross reference. I'm just digressing a little bit, but uh, mm, sorry, Hebrews chapter four and uh, verse three, Hebrews four verse three. Somebody could read that please for us. Now, we who was believed entered that rest just as God has said. So I declared on my oath, in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work have been finished since the creation of the world. Mm. So look at the last part of verse 3. Thank you, Sidkinu. Look at the last part of verse 3. It says, the works were finished from the foundation of the world or from the creation of the world. Very interesting. His works were finished from the time of creation. That means creation started, but God already finished the work. Yeah. His works were finished from before the creation of the world. In what sense? In the mind of God, God finished everything. Then he started creation. So, in the mind of God, everything that would take place in time was already finished. So time is finite, there's a beginning and there's an end. Everything that was going to take place in time was already finished in the mind of God. Part of that was the death of Christ on the cross. 
That's why the Bible says, he is the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world. Now, how, how, how was it possible before the foundation of the world, Jesus was already the Lamb of God slain? Because in the mind of God, the work was finished before it was done. Same thing about the Book of Life. It says, our names were written in the Book of Life book of the Lamb of God before the foundation of the world. How is it possible? In the mind of God, it was done before the work started. Right. So what Paul is saying here in Ephesians 1, 4 is we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. So in the mind of God, he already said, I'm going to have a people who are going to be in Christ. That's my plan. I'm going to do it. And he decided this before creating Adam, before creation. So this life that we are talking about, the life that we have in Christ, is not an afterthought. It's not Paul, the apostle's idea. <laughs> It's something God decided before the foundation of the world. And you and I are just trying to understand that revelation. Oh God, help us understand it, right? But God already had it in his mind before the foundation of the world. So first thing, right? Yes, understand. Second thing I want to point out is as we look at you know Ephesians 1, we see that many things are in the past tense. Many things are in the past tense. That means it's already done. So Paul is not writing about things that God is planning to do in the future, or that we're saying, okay, you know, someday in the sweet by and by. It will happen now. In Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, who has blessed us, meaning it is done. It's a past tense thing. You know, if it was going to be in the future, he would have said, you know, thank God in the future, he will bless us with every blessing. But that's not what he says. What he's saying is, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. It's past tense. So like this, as you read through, you know, the what he's writing here, it's all in the past tense. He has chosen us. He's not going to choose you. He has chosen you. That we should be holy and without blame. Verse 5, he predestined us. He already decided that we would be adopted as sons. Uh, verse 6, in the end of verse 6, he made us accepted in the beloved. It's done. The work is over. You've been accepted in the beloved. Right? Uh, verse 7, we have redemption. It's a present tense thing. We have it. Right? So, there is a lot that is already ours. Right? Now, some things you know we will enter into in the future, like our glorified bodies, and when we get into the millennium, you know, we will reign with Jesus, and there's going to be new heavens and new earth. All those things are coming up in the future. But there are things that we can walk in here and now. That's what we must understand. Second thing is 
this is a completed work. And like I said in the very beginning, the way God works is this. He, he completes the work. And he tells us to live out of that completed work. So he's not going, he's not telling us, go and save yourself. No, he says, I saved you. Now work out your salvation. That means live out of that salvation. You know, I've given you salvation, live with that. Right? I have justified, I made you righteous, live out of that. I have sanctified you, live out of that. I have put you in, at my right hand in the heavenly places, live out of that. I have blessed you with every spiritual blessing, live out of that. He doesn't say, if you do good, I will bless you, then you'll get something. No, I have given it to you by grace, freely. Now by faith, live out of it. So that is how God works. He completes the work for us and he tells us, I want you to live out of that. Right? So the third thing we see here in this passage, Ephesians, one, and this again is in verse three. It says, you know, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. Right? So I want to talk about that in the heavenly realms, meaning this is reality in the spiritual realm. So what he's written for us here in Ephesians 1 is reality, it is truth, it is done in the heavenly realms. Now you and I, we live in the natural world, but we are also connected to the heavenly realms because we are in Christ. So there is this duality of our existence. We are living in the natural world, but there's also the spiritual world. And we are also in the spiritual world because we are in Christ. We are spiritual beings. And as spiritual beings, this is truth. So as a spiritual person in the heavenly realms, you are blessed. Now in natural, maybe at the moment, you're going, maybe could, some of us could be going through a difficult time in the natural. In the natural, maybe some of us could be going through some struggles. But in the spiritual, in the heavenly realms, you are blessed. In the spiritual realm, you are in Christ at the right hand of God. Now in the natural, things may be rough, okay. But in the spiritual, everything here in, 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 the, in the New Testament, everything is given here, is true about you. So you and I have to make a choice. And the beautiful truth is this, the spiritual is more powerful than the natural. Everything in the natural is subject to the spiritual because the spiritual created the natural, right? God is spirit and God created the natural world. So everything in the natural is subject to the spiritual. So you and I must look at the natural with that understanding, hey, Maybe in the natural, I am in the natural world, you know, I'm going through some struggles, I'm going through some challenges, I'm going through a difficult time, whatever. But in the spiritual, in Christ, this is who I am. And I'm going to cause that to bear upon the natural. I'm going to cause what God has done for me in the spirit to change the natural world, to change my natural because everything in the natural is subject to the spiritual. So
so in the heavenly realms but this is truth in the heavenly realms this also means that in the heavenly realms every heavenly being recognizes this about you so think about it in the heavenly realms when the devil looks at you says whoa there's a person who is in Christ there's a person who is seated at the right hand of the Father there's a person who is the righteousness of God who there's a person who is blessed with every spiritual blessing uh, there's a person who is uh, accepted in the beloved so in the heavenly realms when the heavenly beings look at you that's what they see now in the natural you know your friends look at you they might joke at you they may laugh at you they may you know they may say all kinds of things about you because they're only seeing in the natural but in the spiritual this is truth about you right and so we have to learn god this is who i am in the spirit i'm going to cause that to bear upon my natural circumstances my situations that i'm going through i'm going to let these things change and line up with the spiritual okay and we do that by faith by faith in god right it's faith in god that connects us uh, so that the spiritual will change the natural the spiritual will cause uh, a change for us in the natural okay and we're going to learn about faith uh, in another class right so keep that also in mind this is truth if whatever we are saying it is truth in the heavenly realms okay uh, any questions so far you all of you are very listening very patiently but any questions I was looking at the notes here uh, in the heavenly places. Okay. Yeah, did it. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just thinking about the uh, past tense aspect of it. Like uh, we are already chosen before the foundations of the world. So, what about people who reject Christ? So, mm -hmm. uh, is it? like god has already rejected or uh, like i was trying to make sense of that correct okay so that brings us to this whole uh, um, um, aspect of uh, predestination right this whole thing and uh, we will be talking about it uh, a little bit in this course but we will talk more about it in uh, in, in a second year course on uh, apologetics where we try to discuss this whole thing about um, predestination but let me just give a little you know, a, a brief about that right how we understand it uh, predestination means god's foreknowledge but it does not mean god's predetermination so predestination does not mean predetermination that means god is not already determining your choice that choice is what you and i are making but predestination is god's foreknowledge he knows ahead of time like we said he's alpha and omega Right, he's in the beginning and the end. So he already knows the end from the beginning. So he knows already the choices you and I will make. He already knows it. He's not making the choice for you, but he knows the choice you and I will make. So in his foreknowledge, he can already say, those people who receive Christ, you are the chosen ones and you are in Christ and you know these are the things that are yours in Christ. 
So God is not predetermining your choice. He foreknows your choice. But for everybody who chooses, he says, who makes the choices, you are chosen once, and this is what I have for you in Christ. You understood that? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yes, Pastor. Okay. So that's just a very brief answer. We will look at that in depth uh, in a second year course and also in a third year course. Okay, good question. All right, next question here from Sidkin or Robert. If God already knew everything, then why God did not correct the situation? They would not have to sacrifice Jesus Christ. Okay, that's a good question. If God knew everything, you know, why did he let Adam and Eve sin? And why is the world become like this? It really tells us this, that, I mean, it tells us many things about God. First, it tells us that God so desires to have a people for himself who will willingly serve or worship him, that is willing to go through any of these things. These things don't matter. So for us, it seems like such a long time, so much of pain, so much of all of this. But God says, look, at the end of it, I'm going to have a people whom I've chosen in Christ. This is just the process. And to God, this process is worth it. Second, it also tells us that God has given us a free will. And what we do with our free will, we can never, you know, it can never, you know, God has already has a solution to it. So, Adam and Eve, he gave them a free will. And out of the free will, they sinned. But their sin is not greater than God. God says, look, I have a way of redemption. And ultimately, I will have a people whom I have redeemed, who will walk with me out of their own free will. Right? So, God knew everything that was going to happen. He knew Adam and Eve would sin. He knew that Satan you know, was going to rebel even before he created him. But God had a plan and that all these things will come together. You know, it says here that, um, you know, verse 11, he, he works according to the counsel of his own will and he will, you know, he will gather together everything in Christ. That's verse 10. You know, it'll all come together beautifully. And so, God is just, you know, he, he gave us a free will and, and uh, you know, things are going to come together no matter what, right? Does it help answer your question, Sid Kino? Yes, Pastor, very much. Okay. Um, Titus, what about the unbeliever? Are they predestined to hell? Then why evangelism? Like, all right, Titus, so like we mentioned, um, God is not determin determining the individual's choice, right? He has just said, the gospel is the way of salvation. Anybody who re rejects the way of salvation, the gospel, the way of salvation, that's the consequence, eternal separation from God in hell. That's what he's planned. But the choice each one of us make God is not making that choice for us. So our responsibility is to proclaim the gospel. Our responsibility is to give people the opportunity to make the choice to follow Christ, right? So that's why we evangelize or we proclaim the gospel because God hasn't predetermined which individual is going to make which choice. That's their choice. But what he has said is, though there is a way of salvation, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And without Christ, people are eternally lost, right? So we need to go and proclaim the gospel, okay? So a Fourier 
Afuya. I hope I pronounced your name right. Um, we have two types of will, God's will and permissive will. God's will fulfill destiny, but permissive will can dent God's predestiny. Okay. Um, I'm trying to understand your question, Afuya. Afuya, um, God's will and permissive Okay, uh, let me respond to that like this. There is the will of God. That's God's will. And then there is what God, you know, what we do, which of course God permits us to do, right? And yes, you know, when we do things out of the will of God, against the will of God, we disrupt uh, God's personal will for our lives. Okay, that means that um, I may disrupt certain things for my life, but God is bigger than our mistakes, right? So when a person goes back to God and says, Father, I'm sorry, I, I made a mistake. I did something wrong. I did something I shouldn't do. God can restore us, put us back, and he can still fulfill what he intended for our lives. So God's will, but our mistakes, our mistakes are not greater than God. Right? So when we realize we've done something wrong, we go back and he restores us. And we see that even in scripture, we see that, uh, you know, God works uh, in our lives, right? Okay. All right, so, okay. Any other questions before we go on? Just look at my notes here. Okay, let me see here. Shani, go ahead, please, with your question. And Sid can also. Go ahead. Shani, with your question. Oh, sorry, my mic was off. Yeah, I just had a question. So you're saying that we have spiritual blessings, even though we may not be in a certain situation, say financial situation naturally. But I know you said we're blessed spiritually. And you're saying that the way to obtain that is through faith. And I guess meditating on these scriptures about who we are. And then I guess we'll start to believe it and just have faith and it'll just, the spiritual blessing will just come. Is that what you're saying? Um, yeah, so faith is part of that, a very important part of the process, right? So one is, uh, first of all, we need to recognize or understand what God has done for us. We need to begin to believe it, you know, have faith in that and, uh, you know, and then let that word of God and the God create every aspect of our lives. So faith is an important part of that process you know, to see it affect transformation in our lives. So, of course, there are many different areas of life. So, for example, let's say, now this is just an example, let's say, you know, a person uh, is is bound in addictions, things like that. And this person becomes a believer in Christ. So the moment this person becomes a believer in Christ, everything here that we read about and which we are going to learn uh, becomes that person's inheritance. It's true for them. All things are passed away. Everything has become new. Right now, but this person needs to know that you don't need to be bound in sin anymore. The, 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 the thing that Satan does is he tries to keep believers from knowing the truth. And so, you know, uh, Satan would try to tell this person, no, no, you, still, you have to live like this, you have to live in bondage the rest of your life. But the word of God, as we will discover, says you can be free from every bondage. So what, will ha what should happen? This person should know the truth of the word of God and let God work in their lives and they will receive freedom. 
they'll be able to be free uh, in uh, areas of bondage. So that's just one example. Like that, there could be different areas in our lives where we want to see God work. And we, by faith, you know, receive the truth and then let God work in our lives. So this is a process and we will learn. I hope I addressed your question, Shani. Yeah, th I'm sorry. So does that work the same way in terms of finances? Yes, in every way, right? So even in finances, uh, we will learn about our covenant with God, and that God does want to, you know, God is our provider and he will provide. And so we look to him and then through faith in God and in applying his word, we can see the provision of God come into our lives and God meeting all our needs, providing for us. So it works the same way. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Good. All right. Jafina, you have a question? Um, I don't have a question. I just want to know whether my assumption about being chosen is right. Because I believe Jesus came down here on the earth for everyone, whether we are a believer or not a believer. He came down for us, right? So it is our choice because true love is never forced. God never wants us to be forced to be a Christian, to follow him. And I just want to know whether it's right. Like there are many unbelievers around me. Many, friend, many of my friends don't believe in God. But I believe Jesus came down for them too. And it's their, their choice to come to Jesus or not. And yeah, that's what I want to know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so that is correct, right? God doesn't force, he offers, right? He invites, he gives us an invitation. Uh, and then we make the choice to say yes, right? Or some people reject the invitation. That's their choice, right? And God doesn't force it. He wants us all to be saved, he invites us, but then make the choice, okay? Afue, you have a question? Yeah, good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Good, good. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm Afue Ayorinde from Nigeria. Oh, wonderful, Afue. Thank you for joining us from Nigeria. You're welcome. Yeah, Pastor, you just said something now that um, God gives an invitation. It's our choice to accept the invitation. Now, my question is, accepting or rejecting the invitation is it not included in the predestined nature of god to mankind okay accepting the invitation or rejecting the invitation thank you mm. okay thank you so like what we said god gives us the invitation god also knows how we will respond. He knows whether Afue will say yes or no, or, you know, Lyndon will say yes or no, or Elisha will say yes or no, or you know, each one of us. He knows the choice we will make. But he's not dictating the choice. He's not determining that choice. That's a free choice we make. Right? So he gives the invitation to every one of us, each one of us and everybody else in the world. And he says, come. But then each one has to make their choice. God is not predetermining the choice, but he pre-knows. He knows ahead of time the choice. So that's what uh, predestination is. That is, he knows ahead of time the choice we will make. And that for all who say yes, he says, look, my plan for all of you is one plan, that you become like Jesus. You know, that, that's uh, predestination. Now we can go through some scriptures if needed, but let me just try to quickly answer the questions. And uh, all right, Sitkina, you have a question. It's the same one in the chat. Yes, Pastor. Okay. Uh, Afuwe, did I answer your question before I go on to the next one? Okay. All right. Uh, yes, Pastor, Pastor. You have okay. answered my question. God bless you, sir. God bless you, Fue. Uh, 
King Saul was ordained by the Lord, but then why in the end he lost his identity and became a criminal? Yeah. So that shows us um, that, you know, God gives us gifts and graces, but he works together with us. You know, the Bible says we are co-workers with God, right? So God gives his gifts, his grace, his anointing, but that doesn't suddenly make us robots. We are still free will beings. So even with the gift and the grace and the anointing, we have to work with God. We have to walk in line with his will. So that's where Saul missed it. You know, he was anointed to be king. He was wonderfully blessed, wonderful beginning. But as, as he journeyed, he started making mistakes and he deviated from what God wanted for his life. That's why it's so important, like we heard yesterday, throughout our journey on earth, you know, we have to stay aligned to the will of God. So we still have a free will. And we use our free will to choose the will of God. Is that okay, Robert? Yes, Pastor, thank you. Thank you. All right, Nicholson, you have a question? Please go ahead. Yeah, um, it's actually very similar to what Sikino just asked. Um, it's more like a follow-up now, but like he said now, we've seen many people living in our day and age where um, there are big worship leaders who are anointed suddenly um, slide off or fall back and go back to whatever they were doing and deny Christ. I think you just answered that. So, mm -hmm. but uh, to follow up on that, are there consequences to it? Like if you look at Moses' life also, when he hit the rock and he didn't speak to it, there were consequences. So does that still apply in our day and age today? Yeah. So, so Galatians chapter 6, verse 8 and 9, it tells us, you know, that whatever we sow, we will reap. You know, it tells us that if we sow to the Spirit, we will reap of the Spirit. If we sow to the flesh, we will reap of the flesh. Right? So, Taking a simple example, let's say a person has been called by God, anointed by God, uh, and they're walking wonderfully with God, and then let's say they go off track, they do all kinds of wrong things. Will there be consequences for the wrong they did? The answer is yes, they'll face consequences. But if they repent, they come back to God, say, God, sorry, I messed up. The Bible tells us there is mercy. What is the mercy of God? So if you want to understand grace and mercy, grace gives us what we do not deserve. Mercy keeps us from receiving what we do deserve. Right? So mercy in that person's life now that person has done wrong things, there are going to be severe consequences, but mercy lessens that judgment. If you want to look at a scripture, it's in James chapter 2. i give you the exact verse. It says, um, uh, James 2, and I'm looking for, yeah, verse 13. James 2, verse 13. It says, the last part of that says, Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So this person is going to face severe judgment and mercy triumphs. That means mercy keeps that person from receiving the full severe severity of, of whatever he, he has done. So that's the mercy of God. Grace gives us what we do not deserve. Mercy keeps us from receiving the full measure of what we do deserve for the wrong we did. That's mercy. Right? So to answer your question, will there be consequences? Yes. But there's also the mercy of God and mercy triumphs over judgment. You know? Okay. All right. Good questions. 
Go ahead, Shani, your question, please. Shani, sorry, we can't hear your question. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, my microphone was off. Um, you, you just said James chapter, what chapter was that? Chapter 2 and verse 13. Okay, thank you. Yeah, welcome. All right. James 2.13. Thank you, John Paul. Right. So good questions. Appreciate your interactions. So what we've done today is uh, kind of just uh, laid an introduction to this whole truth about who we are in Christ and uh, the fact that uh, we need to receive this revelation and um, we need to grow in this revelation. So Paul prayed, I want you to receive this revelation. Right? So we're going to pick up on this next week, next Tuesday. Uh, take some time. Uh, I have put the course notes on the coursework section. So please download the PDFs and just review it. Uh, you know, you will be able to go over what we discussed today. And also the, the video recordings will come up in the coursework. So in case you want to go back and listen to any part of it, you can. And we'll pick this up next week, start developing it further. But most importantly, right, this truth must grip our hearts, our identity in Christ. We have to live out of that. We have to understand it, receive revelation, and live out of who we are in Christ. Okay? We're going to close in prayer in a few more minutes and then we have to close and then get ready for our next class. So um, I just want to request somebody uh, to close us in prayer and dismiss the class, please. Somebody could pray and we will close. Heavenly Father, once again, Lord, we thank you. Praise you, Master, for this beautiful day, Lord. Thank you for speaking to us, Lord, to your servant, Lord. Lord, thank you that uh, helping us to know that who we are, Lord, in you. Lord, I pray that, Lord, that you bless us, that, Lord, we will not just know, but, Lord, we will see that you are, are living in our life, Master. That for the people, they recognize us, Lord, that we are in you, Master. That our family, they uh, see you in our life, Master. Lord. So thank you so much for our beloved past, Lord, continue with blessing, Lord. And the Lord, he teaches us, Lord. Lord, you bless him, Lord. We thank you for every... I think what you have done in our life, Master. So thank you. Praise you. Jesus. Name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording here. So have a